In early October 1955, at around 5am, a boat left the Polynesian island of Samoa and headed for the Tokalu Islands, which was a journey of 270 miles. At the helm of the boat was Captain Miller, along with 25 crew and passengers. Her date to sail had originally been delayed due to a port engine clutch failure and had left port on only one engine bound for the islands. The journey should have taken about two days. MV Joyita was built as a private luxury yacht in Los Angeles in 1931. She was 69 foot long and the ship's hull was constructed of two inch thick cedar on oak frame so that she was a sturdy boat. The yacht was named after the actress Jewel Carmen, who was an American silent film actress in the late 1910s. Joyita is Spanish for little Jewel. In 1936, she was sold to another private owner who made frequent trips up and down the coast between LA and Mexico. In October 1941, she was acquired by the Navy and renamed YP-108 and was employed to patrol around Pearl Harbor. The boat was lucky to survive as she was present during the Japanese attack in December 1941. After the war in 1946, she was sold as surplus where the new owners added two engines of cork to her hull, along with refrigerated cargo spaces. In the 1950s, she was being used as a charter fishing vessel and small cargo vessel in the Copra trade. On October 6, 1955, she was reported overdue, but at that stage, there was no concern as no distress signal had been received in the area. However, as time passed, a search and rescue mission began, which lasted until October the 12th. The search covered 100,000 square miles of ocean, but there was no sign of Joita, and there was no sign of her passengers or crew, and the search was eventually called off. About one month later, on November the 10th, the merchant ship Tuvalu sighted the Joita 600 miles west from her expected destination. They had found her drifting and partially submerged, and she was listing heavily to port. There was no sign of any of the crew or passengers, and the four tons of her medical supplies were also missing. The boat and three life rafts were also missing, including the ship's log. There was much damage with her flybridge smashed away and the windows of her deckhouse broken. Behind the bridge, someone had erected a tarpaulin to act as a shelter. The fact that the boat had been listing for a long period of time had allowed barnacle growth above the waterline. She was eventually towed to port, where an inquest was then held into the disappearances. The court determined that the boat was found in poor state of repair, but at the same time the boat was extremely buoyant and was not in major danger of sinking, in spite of a list. Overall, she was in a bad state of repair, but due to the cork additions and the partial cargo of empty 55-gallon oil drums, she was in no immediate danger of sinking. Droida's tanks still contained fuel, and it was calculated she had travelled approximately 243 miles before she was abandoned within 50 miles of Tokolo Islands. The electric clocks on board had stopped at 10.25pm, and the switches for the cabin lighting and navigation lights were still on signifying that whatever had occurred had happened at night. The ship's sextant, mechanical chronometer and other navigational equipment, as well as firearms that were kept in the boat, were missing. The radio had been tuned to 2182 kHz, which is the International Marine Radio Telephone Distress Channel. A break was found in the antenna cable, which would have limited the effective range of the distress calls to about two miles, but in an unusual twist, the cable had been painted over to obscure the break. A doctor's bag was found on deck, containing a stethoscope, a scalpel, and a concerning fact that there were four lengths of blood-stained bandages. They discovered that the boat did not have enough life jackets for everyone on board, and the ship's boat and three rescue life rafts had apparently been deployed. The starboard engine had been covered by mattresses, and the port engine's clutch was still partially disassembled, showing that the boat was still running on only one engine. However, they found a hull was sound, and they found the water came into the lower decks via a pipe in the raw water circuit of the cooling system. The pipe had corroded due to galvanic corrosion, allowing water into the engine spaces. The bilge pumps had no strainers, and had likely clogged with debris, not allowing the water to be pumped out. An auxiliary pump had been rigged in the engine room, however, it had not been connected. 
Though the boat had many technical problems, the board was unable to figure out why an experienced captain would leave a larger boat in no danger of sinking to put everyone at the mercy of the elements in small rafts and one craft. This course of action was deemed to be inexplicable on the evidence submitted at the inquiry. After the court submissions, there were many wild theories put forward as to the disappearance of the passengers and crew, and why at least out of 25 people on board, one or two of the bodies had not eventually been washed up on a beach. There is one scenario that Captain Miller was the only one to know about the boat's problems and had somehow become incapacitated. This could have led to panic amongst the crew and passengers while they suddenly took to the life rafts. Maybe a scuffle broke out, leading to injuries, hence the bloodstained bandages. One of the passengers was a surgeon who would have taken care of any injuries and would also have cared for the captain. If this was the case, they would have been unable to take all the navigation equipment or four tons of cargo. So where did this equipment end up? The Fiji Times and Herald had a credible witness who claimed that the Joita had encountered a fleet of Japanese fishing boats en route to its destination. Maybe the crew of the boat had seen the Japanese doing something illegal of which the Japanese wished to keep quiet. The theory did appear to gain traction, where they found knives aboard the boat that were stamped made in Japan. However, after further investigation, Tess determined that the knives were probably used on board in the late 1940s during fishing operations. As this incident happened only a few years after World War II, there was still much anti-Japanese sentiment in the region, and there was a lot of anger when the Japanese were granted permission to operate their fishing fleece in the surrounding waters. Another crazy theory that a local paper reported was that some Japanese soldiers were still fighting the war and were operating from a nearby hidden base. As the 1950s was the height of the Cold War, there was a theory that the boat's crew and passengers were kidnapped by a Soviet submarine, as they'd been illegally spotted in the region. People believed this scenario at the time, as there was much paranoia between the Soviet Union and the West. There is a scenario that they were attacked by pirates. The theory is that the pirates attacked the boat and disposed of all the crew and passengers and stole all of the tons of cargo. Another possible cause was mutiny which was put forward by a travel writer in 1962 who published a book about how a mutiny may have come about. He claimed that events could have started with flooding by the cooling pipes along with increasingly heavy swells that would have buffeted the ship with Captain Miller believing that it was close to the port. The author also claimed that there was bad blood between the captain and his first mate Simpson, where due to the bad weather, Simpson and some of the crew demanded he turn back. Somehow, the captain and Simpson both became incapacitated. The boat became further imperiled with the failure of the bilge pumps and inclement weather causing the starboard engine to fail at around 10pm, where the boat was then plunged into darkness. This would have led to mayhem and confusion as the listing got worse, leading to panic amongst the remaining passengers, causing them to abandon ship, fearing it was about to sink. Questions have to be asked as to why they abandoned the still floating boat in the middle of a storm and boarded small rafts in such bad weather. Maybe they decided at nearby island and reef, believing they could reach it, but were unable to because of the strong winds and currents in the storm. Authorities believe that the actual damage that was done to the superstructure was caused afterward by waves while the ship drifted. Over the years, many sightings of Captain Miller had been reported around the Pacific Rim, but all proved to be false and he no doubt perished along with the crew and passengers where no bodies were ever found. The Joyita was resiled at auction in 1956 and passed through a series of owners, but the life of the boat never improved and a sad end came when she was finally abandoned on a beach in the early 1960s. Later, someone tried to resurrect her and turn her into a floating museum and tourist attraction. But unfortunately, those plans never came to fruition and she gradually succumbed to the elements and by the late 1970s, there was almost nothing left of her.